Greatness. It is what all NFL teams are pursuing at the start of each NFL season. Every team aspires to be the one to raise the Lombardi Trophy over every team in the league. However, the grueling 18-week schedule of the NFL is not one that is easy to steamroll. It takes unreal commitment, talent, and luck to make a Super Bowl run happen. Sometimes teams that have everything on paper to go all the way have a miracle season just to come up short when it matters the most. The 2007 New England Patriots are one of the best teams to not win a Super Bowl. They managed to have a perfect 16-0 record in the regular season just to be bested by Eli Manning and the Giants in the Super Bowl. Today on Football Lore, we explore the 2007 New England Patriots and their incredible regular season run and just what happened to make them fall short at the highest level. Their downfall was historic in the grand scheme of the NFL and it was a tragedy of what could have been. If you like football documentaries like this then press the like button. We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers this year and need all the help in the algorithm we can get. Hopefully this video helps document one of the best regular season teams in NFL history. The 2007 New England Patriots were coming off an already solid 2000 2006 campaign, where they had secured a 12-4 record. They had blown a solid lead over the Indianapolis Colts, led by Peyton Manning, in the AFC Championship game. And the Super Bowl was the only thing on their minds. They had lost both of their main receivers in the offseason, so their number one priority was getting new targets for Tom Brady to throw to. They signed Dante Stallworth and then traded for Wes Welker and Hall of Fame receiver Randy Moss. This added a level of explosiveness the Patriots hadn't had in the previous seasons. They also had to deal with the tragic death of Marquise Hill, who had fallen off of a jet ski in New Orleans during the offseason. The defensive end had been a key presence in the locker room, and as such, the team decided to wear a 91 decal on their helmet for the duration of the season. They had a solid preseason where they had gone 2-2, two and two, but honestly, most of the league had them pegged as favorites to make a run at the Super Bowl that year. This era was dominated by super quarterbacks like Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. It was not unusual for them to meet in the playoffs at some point. Their first game of the season was with the New York Jets. Their first drive of the season was a success when Wes Welker capped the drive with an 11-yard touchdown. The next scoring drive came off the back of several large Randy Moss receptions that put them into the red zone. Tom Brady would throw a five-yard pass to a tight end to cap the drive. They were up 14-7 going into halftime, but came out with huge momentum in the second half when they returned the kickoff for a touchdown. Tom Brady would then connect with Moss on a 51-yard touchdown down pass to take their lead to 28-7. From there, they had another field goal and a rushing touchdown, but walked away with a 38-14 victory. Many thought that this would be a rather uneventful game on the Patriots' schedule, but little did anyone know the Patriots were about to be rocked by scandal. On September 10, 2007, Bill Belichick was accused by the New York Jets staff of filming the Jets' defensive signals before their matchup, which was a clear violation of league rules. The Jets had caught a Patriots assistant with a video camera camera, taping their defensive practice the week before the game. They filed a complaint to the league office, and this entire saga would become known as Spygate to the fans of the NFL across the nation. The league did not take long to hand down punishment. After all, they had caught the Patriots pretty much red-handed with a video camera in the Jets' possession. On September 13th, just three days after the initial story had broken, Belichick was given a half a million dollar fine, and the Patriots were fined $250,000 and forced to forfeit their first round pick if they made the playoffs. Goodell had said he had initially considered suspending Belichick outright but decided stripping the first overall draft pick could prove to be more of a punishment in the long run of the team. Belichick would later issue a statement where he apologized for his mistake, but he still claims to this day the videotapes were not taken in order to give any type of competitive advantage to the New England Patriots. While this story was going on, a media circus developed around the Patriots, but they didn't have time to give it too much attention since they had an upcoming matchup with the Phillip Rivers-led Chargers that would prove to be a test of their football prowess. They had last played the Chargers in the divisional round of the NFL playoffs, and many thought it could be a great matchup. The Patriots would score on their first drive and take a 7-0 lead. The very first play of the Chargers drive, Roosevelt Collin, would intercept a pass to give possession back to the Patriots. They wouldn't capitalize on this drive, but it was clear the performance had potential to be one-sided. The Patriots then drove downfield, with Brady connecting with Moss for another touchdown, and they would kick a field goal early in the second half to give 
give themselves a 17 to nothing lead. The Chargers were putting together a long drive down the field, but Rivers was picked off by Adelius Thomas, who returned the pick for a 65-yard touchdown. The Patriots would keep a commanding lead of the game and go on to win 38-14 when the fourth quarter wrapped up. At this point, everyone in the NFL was talking about how high-scoring the Patriots had become. I mean, sure, they were always liable to score a lot of points with Tom Brady, but the combination of Randy Moss deep alongside Wes Welker in the slot was proving almost impossible for any teams to stop. They had scored 30 points in each of their two first games, and their defense had been playing at an equally high level. Their next matchup was with the Buffalo Bills, who hadn't beat the Patriots since the 2003 season. Nothing really changed in this matchup, as Tom Brady went on to destroy the team through the air. Buffalo wasn't able to get anything going on the ground or, or in the sky, and they were demolished with a final score of 38-7. to Through the first three games of the year, Brady had already managed to cross the 10-touchdown mark, and everyone started to think there was a chance he could break the NFL record this season. The next two weeks would prove to contain two more blowouts for the Patriots squad, who would blow out the Bengals 34-13 to and the Browns 34-17. to It was this game where Tom Brady was actually able to tie Steve Young's record for most consecutive games with three touchdown passes. In every one of his appearances this year, he had been able to connect for at least three scores. It didn't matter what type of coverages teams were trying to throw at the Patriots. It just didn't seem like there was any way to slow them down when it came to moving the ball through the air. Tom Brady was putting on a masterclass on how to get the ball to the end zone, and it wasn't going to stop after week five. Week six took their streaks of blowouts to the next level. When they played the Dallas Cowboys, Brady was able to connect with Moss on the first drive of the game to give the Patriots an early lead and would extend the lead to 14 points with his second scoring pass of the first quarter. While Brady would be strip-sacked for a Cowboys touchdown on a following drive, he would immediately strike back with a 72-yard drive that culminated in a 12-yard touchdown pass. The Cowboys, however, would answer with another score of their own to give them a small lead over the Patriots going into halftime. The Patriots would answer this with another Tom Brady touchdown early in the third, and they followed it up with a field goal to take a 31-24 lead. The Cowboys would answer this with a punt that Brady would use to set up his fifth touchdown pass on the day. It was a 69-yard franchise record throw to Dante Stallworth that gave the Patriots a 38-24 lead. They went on to kick yet another field goal, and Kyle Eckel ran in the last touchdown to give them a dominant 48-27 victory. This was huge because the Cowboys had been the NFC's last remaining undefeated team. With this, the Patriots had really established themselves as the clear favorite to make a deep playoff run. Their next two weeks weren't anything particularly challenging, and they made quick work of the Dolphins and the Redskins with back-to-back 40-point -back games. Their Week 9 matchup was honestly going to be their hardest matchup of the year. They were facing the Indianapolis Colts with a prime Peyton Manning. If they wanted to stay undefeated, they really had to bring their A game. Both teams were coming into the matchup at 7-0, and zero, and everyone knew one of these two teams would be representing the AFC in the Super Bowl. The game went scoreless for the first several drives, with the score being just 3 to nothing for the Colts at the end of the first quarter. The Patriots were able to score a touchdown in the second quarter with a Brady to Moss pass, but the Colts answered with another field goal to make it a one-point game. The Colts would close out the first half with a Peyton Manning touchdown to give them a 13-7 lead going into halftime. The third quarter opened up equally scoreless until the Patriots were able to get into field goal range and put one through the uprights. This was the only score of the entire quarter, and the Colts held on to their three-point lead going into the fourth. The Colts scored again in the fourth to extend their lead to 10 points with just 10 minutes left in the game. Everyone started to think the Patriots had actually been defeated, but one thing you have to do when Tom Brady is playing is prepare for a fourth quarter comeback. He went on to throw two more touchdowns in the third quarter, with the time expiring to give the Patriots a 24-20 victory against Peyton Manning and the Colts. This let the cat out of the bag. Most people thought the Colts were going to be the only team capable of stopping the Patriots, and with them defeated, the path to the playoffs was clear for the Patriots. They had a Week 10 bye, but came back to the Buffalo Bills once again in Week 11. They absolutely destroyed them with a final score of 56-10. It was the most points scored by a road team since 19. 
1973 and tied the franchise record for highest score in one game. Week 12 was another close game for the Patriots. As they took on the Philadelphia Eagles, the Eagles were led by A.J. Feely, but had a solid secondary defense that would make it hard for Brady to dominate through the air. The game got off to a good start for the Patriots when A.J. Feely threw an interception to Asante Samuel that was returned for a touchdown. The Eagles used the next time to follow it up with a touchdown of their own. Before the Patriots' offense even took the field, the score was 7-7. They did manage to score on their first outing, but the Eagles scored on their next drive as well. The Patriots would take the lead after a successful field goal, but the Eagles and wouldn't let them hold the lead for long, with A.J. Feely throwing another touchdown. With only three minutes left in the half, the Patriots marched down the field and ended up scoring with the time expiring to give them a 24-21 lead at halftime. The second half was initially dominated by the defenses that forced punts early. The Patriots would miss a field goal, and the Eagles would capitalize on this opportunity by scoring a touchdown to take the lead. With just seven minutes left in the game, the Patriots ran a touchdown that put the Patriots ahead 31 to 28. A.J. Feely would throw another interception to Asante Samuel that would seal the Eagles' fate and seal the Patriots' victory. They were now 11-0, giving them one of the longest winning streaks in NFL history. They had another hard-fought victory the next week against the Baltimore Ravens and then trounced the Steelers 34-13 the following week. Their Week 15 matchup was against the New York Jets that had kicked off Spygate, but even without their signals recorded, they beat them 20-10. Week 16 wasn't too much of a challenge either either because they were able to defeat the Dolphins 28-7. Week 17, though, would bring a strange amount of foreshadowing that would be ironic just months later. They were slated to play the New York Giants and were seeking to secure their 16th win of the season. This would mean a historic undefeated season for the Patriots, and it was one of the highest-rated NFL games of the entire season. It had one of the largest amounts of coverage for any non-Super Bowl game in history. If the Patriots won this game, they would be the first team since the change to a 6 16-game schedule to go undefeated in the regular season. On the second play of the game, the Giants would show they weren't going to be a rag doll with a 51-yard pass from Eli Manning to Plaxico Burris. They capitalized on this with a touchdown pass three plays later and took an early lead. The Patriots responded with a field goal of their own and then took the lead with a Tom Brady touchdown on the next drive. This was Randy Moss's 22nd touchdown catch, which tied the single-season NFL record held by Jerry Rice. It also meant Tom Brady had just tied the record for most touchdowns in the regular season that Peyton Manning had set in 2004. Here he was playing Peyton's brother and taking the record from him. The Giants weren't going to let them have a long time to celebrate when they ran the kickoff back for a touchdown to regain the lead. The Patriots would respond with a field goal, but even that left the Giants with a one-point lead. They had another field goal on their next drive, and with under two minutes in the half, had a small two-point lead. The next two minutes saw Eli Manning put on a master class of how to command an NFL field, and with just 18 seconds left in the half, he threw a touchdown to secure a lead going into halftime. The Giants came out swinging in the second half as well, with a touchdown to extend their lead, and this put the Patriots in the largest deficit they had encountered through the whole season. The Patriots would score on their next drive, and then both offenses sputtered. With 12 minutes left in the fourth quarter, the Patriots got the ball back, and Brady threw a 65-yard touchdown pass to Randy Moss. This meant they had both broken the record for most single-season touchdowns for their position. They rode this momentum into a successful two-point conversion and held a 31-28 lead with 11 minutes left. They had had an interception on the next play and then had a successful drive with a rushing touchdown to gain another seven points on their lead. The Giants did manage to score with three and a half minutes remaining, but when the Patriots recovered their onside kick, it was just a series of kneels until the Patriots secured the first undefeated regular season in NFL history. They had been an offensive juggernaut throughout the entire year. Tom Brady had thrown for over 4,800 yards and a record 50 touchdowns. Randy Moss had broken the record with 23 receiving touchdowns, alongside almost 1,500 yards with 98 receptions. Wes Welker had a great season of his own, with a record 112 receptions and 1,100 yards. Their defense had been led by Teddy Bruschi, Mike Vrabel, Junior Se 
Leal and Asante Samuel. They had been solid defense, but most of their success came from outscoring anyone they came into contact with. They obviously had won their division, but the second best team in the AFC East were the Bills, with a 7-9 record. They were really that dominant against anyone they faced. They had secured a bye week going into the playoffs, but everyone assumed that the Patriots were going to win the Super Bowl and put a cap on their perfect season. It wasn't an easy road ahead. Playoff football takes on another level of competition. Their first playoff game of the year was against the Jacksonville Jaguars in the divisional round. The Jaguars were led by David Garrard and would score on their opening drive to take an early 7-0 lead. The Patriots were not one for letting the other team hold the lead and scored on their drive to tie it all up at 7. The next drive, the defense would get involved when they would have a strip sack on Garrard to give the offense possession on the Jaguars' 29-yard line. They would run the ball in to take a 14-7 lead early into the game. The Jaguars would score on their next drive as well, and going into halftime, it was 14-14. Brady would open up the second half by going 7-8 for eight on a scoring drive that gave them a single touchdown advantage. The Jaguars answered with a 39-yard field goal, but still found themselves down by four points. The Patriots would punch another one into the end zone to go up 28-17. to 17. The Patriots and Jaguars would score another field goal, but that would be the last score of the game. Rodney Harrison would get an interception that would seal the Jaguars' fate, and the Patriots would win 31-20. to 20. This put them in their second straight AFC Championship game, and it also meant they tied the 1973 Dolphins for most wins in a single season with 17. The next week, they would be facing the San Diego Chargers, who were also having a great year on the offensive side of the ball. The game got off to a rough start with Brady throwing an interception at the end of the first quarter. This interception set up a Chargers field goal. Brady would bounce back on the next drive with a 65-yard drive that ended with a running touchdown. From here, the Chargers had another field goal, but Asante Samuel would intercept Phillip Rivers on the 24-yard line to set up a Patriots touchdown. The Patriots defense held strong, forcing yet another field goal from the Chargers. On the first drive of the second half, Tom Brady threw another interception, which set up yet another Chargers field goal. This was their fourth field goal of the game, and if they would have capitalized on even one of these opportunities, there is a good chance this game has a different result at the end. New England then drove all the way to the two-yard line before Brady would throw his third interception of the game. This was a seriously disappointing playoff performance for Brady. He usually was known for having a high level of play in the playoffs, but if the Patriots' defense didn't hold as strong as it did, they wouldn't have ended up winning this game. The Patriots would go on to score early in the fourth to make the score 21 to 12, and that is what it would remain until time expired. This made the New England Patriots the first NFL team to start 18 and 0. They were also advancing to their fourth Super Bowl in seven years. It cemented the Patriots dynasty even more than it was already put in stone. It also ended all discussions about what the best football team of any season was, as they had won 18 straight games and taken the record from the Miami Dolphins. They now had to focus on the upcoming Super Bowl and hope for the best. They would be facing the New York Giants, who they had played in the last game of the season. The Giants hadn't even won their division that year. Instead, their 10-6 and record earned them an appearance in the wild card round of the playoffs. They didn't have high expectations coming into the year, with many thinking it was time to fire Tom Coughlin and get rid of Eli Manning. Both were told this would be their last year guaranteed to be on the Giants without some real success. Not many thought there was any way they would even make the playoffs. Eli Manning had no real success in New York up to this point, while other quarterbacks taken in his draft class had already won a Super Bowl or gone 14-2 and during the regular season. Eli was playing like a journeyman. Many fans thought it was safe to call him a bust at this point, and it really was going to be his last year in New York before they just nuked the entire team and started a rebuild. Pressures were even higher when you consider his older brother Peyton Manning was one of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game who was in his prime. It made his underwhelming performances even more evident, but Eli had something to prove as a member of one of the deepest football dynasties in existence. Their regular season was okay, but they did manage to earn a wild card spot in the playoffs. They had to face the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the Raymond James Stadium in Florida. The first quarter saw the Giants absolutely dominated by the Buccaneers. 
with them being down by seven at the end of the first quarter. With an abysmal negative two yards on offense, they somehow came back with two touchdowns in the second quarter to get up by a touchdown. They had another opportunity to put points on the board with a field goal. And then Corey Webster intercepted a pass in the end zone that Eli Manning used to drive downfield for a touchdown to secure a 24-7 lead. The Buccaneers scored again, but the Giants held on for a 24-14 victory. Their next game was against their divisional rival Cowboys, who had a 13-3 season and were the favorites to go to the Super Bowl that year. The Giants ended up scoring just three minutes into the game on a pass from Eli Manning to Amari Toomer. The Cowboys responded with a touchdown of their own and then scored yet again to make it 14-7 for the Cowboys with one minute to go in the half. The Giants went on a miracle drive that ended with a touchdown with just 11 seconds in the half. The second half came down to defense, with it being mostly scoreless out side of touchdown and field goal for the Giants that secured a 21-17 victory. The NFC Championship game was against the Green Bay Packers. The game was literally a frozen death match with game time temperatures of negative one degrees. Brett Favre was looking to add to his legacy with the Packers, and the home field advantage couldn't be ignored. The Giants were the first to get on the scoreboard with a field goal on their first drive. After this, they had another field goal and took an early 6-0 lead. Brett Favre had a 90-yard pass to Donald driver to give the Packers a one-point lead. Green Bay would settle for a field goal on their last drive of the half, and going into halftime, they had a 10-6 lead. The Giants would score on their first drive of the half, but the Packers would fire right back with a touchdown of their own. The Giants then went on to score yet another touchdown to take a 20-17 lead in the third quarter. The Packers would kick a field goal with 12 minutes left to tie the game, but from there, the remainder of the game was scoreless. Regulation ended with a tied game, and the overtime protocols were put into effect. At the time the NFL was still operating on the first to score was the winner rules, which meant if anyone was able to kick a field goal, it would seal their victory and their trip to the Super Bowl. The Packers got the ball first, but threw an interception to Corey Webster. The Giants were not able to put together a long drive, but decided to kick the field goal anyways. It was a 47-yard field goal attempt in literally frozen conditions, but somehow their kicker was able to put it through the uprights just barely. This this field goal sealed the Giants' trip to the Super Bowl, and they stormed the field to celebrate. The loss was so devastating to the Packers that it would be the last season Favre would spend as a Packer. He went the next year to the Jets, and the Packers went on to have Aaron Rodgers right after. This officially made the Super Bowl matchup between the New York Giants and New England Patriots, and betting odds heavily favored the Patriots. I mean, think about it. Sure, the Giants had a good playoff run, but the Patriots hadn't lost a single game all season. It was very unrealistic that they would be able to beat Tom Brady and crew, especially because they had never played on a stage this large before. Almost everyone in the nation assumed that it would be a cakewalk for the Patriots. There was no way Eli Manning would be able to extend this miracle run to a Lombardi trophy. Everyone expected it to be a high-scoring shootout, just like their matchup at the end of the regular season had been. The Patriots came into the game heavy favorites, but the Giants won the toss and went on the longest opening drive in Super Bowl history. It took 10 minutes for them to march down the field, 77 yards, but they had to settle for a field goal early. The Patriots replied with a touchdown of their own to take the lead, but it took so long that the second quarter had started by the time they scored. Each team had only one drive in the first quarter. The hopes of a high-scoring shootout had gone out of the window. The game remained a scoreless event through the second quarter, and going into halftime, the Patriots were up 7-3. The Patriots went into the locker room needing to make serious adjustments. While their offense had been destroyed everyone in the air this season, the Giants were making it difficult for them to move down the field. The defense was doing a great job making it hard for the Giants, but there was no way they would be able to prevent them from scoring forever at this rate. The Giants knew they had the Patriots a bit stunned and had to continue with their game plan if they had any shot of winning. The second half started scoreless through the third quarter as well, and it wouldn't be until Eli Manning constructed a seven-play, 80-yard drive that another score would be made. He threw a touchdown to David Tyree to put the Giants up by three with under 12 minutes left in the game. New England ended up being able to score a touchdown with just two minutes left in the game, and many thought at this point the game was over. 
They had a four-point lead with just a few minutes remaining, and the Giants needed to march all the way down the field and score to have a chance at victory. The Giants got the ball on their own 17-yard line, and on this drive, with one minute remaining, Eli Manning would spin out of a sack by Jarvis Green and throw a 32-yard pass to David Tyree. This now infamous reception saw Tyree pinning the ball to his helmet as he was tackled to the ground, and the crowd watched stunned as the Giants picked up the first down. This totally changed the momentum of the game, and suddenly the Giants felt like they had a chance to actually make the comeback. The next few plays played out in the red zone, but Eli Manning found Plaxico Burris to give the Giants a three-point lead with just 35 seconds remaining. The Patriots sat on the sideline stupefied as the chances of their perfect season were low. No one had expected the Giants to be the ones to break their win streak, and football fans couldn't believe that Eli Manning had taken down the Giant in the biggest game of the year. Tom Brady did attempt to put a drive together, but the Giants' defense didn't allow them to get a single yard. The game was over, and the the Giants were the new Super Bowl champions of the NFL. The Patriots' overall record dropped to 18-1, and, and Eli Manning solidified his position as the Giants' quarterback for the remainder of his career. It was one of the most iconic moments in NFL history, but the Patriots fans were stunned. The Boston Globe had even put up pre-orders for a book about the historic 19-0 season the Patriots were about to complete. That is how sure they were of a victory. The Giants went on to celebrate on the field, and David Tyree's catch became one of the most famous plays in history. While Tom Brady had had won NFL MVP and Athlete of the Year, I'm sure he would have traded that in a heartbeat for an undefeated season. Eight Patriot players had been selected to the Pro Bowl, and five were placed on the All-Pro team. They had broken countless records along the way, but it was not enough for a perfect season. By the time the 2008 season rolled around, Asante Samuel, Randall Gay, and Eugene Wilson had moved on to different teams. Dante Stallworth had relocated to Cleveland, and while they were still the league favorites, that would be destroyed when Tom Brady tore his ACL and MCL in the first game of the season. They did go on to perform somewhat well with Matt Castle, but it wasn't enough to secure another legendary run. The 2007 Patriots were one of the best NFL teams to ever play on the field, and if they would have completed their perfect season, it would have been one of the most impressive feats in football history. I think it is funny that Tom Brady was an undeniable Super Bowl menace, but this started the Eli Manning rivalry that Eli would actually go on to dominate. It's strange that Eli Manning's big biggest successes came when defeating Brady in the Super Bowl. That is the tale of the downfall of the 2007 New England Patriots, the team that flew too close to the sun but couldn't finish when it mattered the most. If you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate you pressing the like button and leaving a comment down below. We are trying to hit 10,000 subscribers this year and would really appreciate your support. If you enjoy these types of videos, the last one we posted was a video about how Ocho Cinco totally changed the NFL forever. Consider giving it a watch. Thank you so much for watching this video.